Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Dr. Ellie Vintiadis. She's a philosopher of mind and psychiatry at the RE, the American College of Greece. She is the author of three books, including the one we're going to talk about today, which is titled Philosophy by Women, 22 Philosophers Who Reflect on Philosophy and Its Value. So, Dr. Vintiadis, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to have you on. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Okay, so it's interesting that in your book, uh, you and your co-authors, uh, apart from talking about uh, the role that women might have played in philosophy, you also uh, explore uh, general topics in philosophy, like trying to understand what it really is, how it works, how it is produced. So let's start with that. First of all, uh, if someone were to ask you, what is philosophy, what would be your answer? That's an incredibly difficult uh, question you're posing. Um, I would, I think the best explanation of what philosophy is was given by Wilfred Sellers when he said that philosophy is the attempt to understand how things in the broadest possible sense of the term hang together in the broadest possible sense of the term. Now, so I think it's it's generally an inquiry um, into understanding, to understand ourselves, the world, um, our institutions, other people, our relations to all of these, and what these relations, what obligations um, uh, these relations uh, carry with them. So, yes, I think it's generally an attempt to understand everything <laughs> by revealing connections between everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that is. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah, but but I, I mean, in it, in its production. <laughs> Do people, uh, can emotions, for example, also play a role there? Because, I mean, when we think about philosophy, it seems like a very, I, I mean, I'm not, I, I don't like this term very much, but it seems like a very cerebral thing and very rational and so on. But can emotions play a role there? Well, yes, um, I think they definitely can play a role. Um, Emotions are very good because they can provide insights that reason sometimes cannot. But I also don't like to think um, in, in dualist terms about this. We, right. Ever since the ancient Greek, we think in terms of reason and the passions or emotions as two conflicting forces. But we know enough from, I think even from neuroscience, um, Damasio's work, for instance, or psychology, from the 1970s already, that these things work together. So I don't think it even makes sense to talk, strictly speaking, about these two things as opposing forces. Um, having said that, I think emotions, we need to study emotions, first of all, because emotions come into everything. If we think about our relationships with people, with animals, if we think about power structures, emotions are there. There's love, there's grief, there's anger, there's shame. We need to understand these emotions. So intellectually, we need to understand these. But um, we also um, um, need to to be able to identify our own emotions when we think about things, because they're there. And if you don't identify them, if you don't know they are there, that can lead you to ways of thinking that might be wrong. Mm -hmm. Right. And if, what I, if I may say something about yeah. the. The book was not intended to be about women in philosophy. It was intended to be about philosophy. So mm -hmm. that, that was, I, I wanted the book that really, um, we, we try to explain what philosophy is, right? And I also wanted to break the stereotype of uh, the philosopher as a white elderly um, male, right? And I thought, okay, without talking about women in philosophy, let's have women philosophers, well, philosophers who are women, uh, talk to people. But then as the production came along and the, uh, the publishing houses had the say in this, we had to bring, to, to market it as women in philosophy. Okay, so I mean, to uh, talking about that, so your initial idea was to have, in this case, 
women talking about philosophy and not really uh, focusing on perhaps how women have been sort of neglected in the history of philosophy. Is that it? Yes, that, that wasn't my intention to begin with. I left it very open to the contributors to talk about that too, to talk about their experience in philosophy, anything really. Uh, but my intention was only to, for us to think about what philosophy is and, and try and express what we thought about that. And uh, implicitly, by having a person opening a book with women philosophy, break that stereotype that it's only men that do this and women are not very good at it. Right. Okay, I understand. And can, uh, can personal experience also play a role in philosophy? So does it help the production of philosophy in any way? Oh, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. The, um, the questions we, we ask, we raise, the, the interests we have, those um, are intimately connected to the lives we lead. And I think one of the things that changes when we allow uh, not only women, but all my people, all groups that are minorities in philosophy to talk um, and, and to have a voice, the, what happens is that they bring in new questions because they are questions that affect them. Um, uh, if, um, for instance, um, I, I'm thinking now of the metaphysics of easy examples, the metaphysics of pregnancy. Pregnancy was some, is something that's part of everyone's life um, in one way or another. Um, but it was a, a question that was never touched upon because it's not part of the male experience. It's a feminine thing, right? Now women come along and they say, wait, let's talk about this. There are different ways to think about pregnancy. And if you think about pregnancy in different ways, then um, questions or in ethics change. Uh, questions about metaphysics come forward, ontology come forward, that we have to think about differently. Or if we think about um, uh, queer and trans people in philosophy, they come along and say, look, maybe not everything about your gender can be read off your body. That's another viewpoint, which maybe um, a cis person would never, would never raise. So, of course, uh, your personal experience is important, both in how you approach a problem, but what the questions you're going to raise, what's important to you. Mm -hmm. But I mean, you're not trying to be divisive here in the sense that, for example, if women, because of how we, how we men and women differ biologically, if women have certain experiences in life that men do not go through, men can also have a saying in that, in terms of the philosophy behind it or not. Oh yes, of course. Uh, we can raise the questions and then we can discuss. I also don't mean to say that just because you don't have an experience, you necessarily cannot understand the question. Mm -hmm. Bring it up. Uh, Mill, John Stuart Mill is famous for this. He he talked about women's questions. Maybe not. Maybe his um, his wife helped him, but um, uh, but generally the, the truth is that. Certain things that are, are not raised by, by people that are not, do not have those experiences. Mm -hmm. uh, for a fact, not of necessity. Uh, that's what I'm saying, yes. Yeah, okay. So, can we talk about one philosophic method? I mean, because, for example, in science, sometimes people discuss, particularly in the philosophy of science, if there's one scientific method, but is that, does that discussion also occur in philosophy? Not to the extent that we discuss it when it comes to science, but uh, I think, strictly speaking, there is no one method, no. Um, if we want to talk about a method, it's that, first of all, uh, we, we have a critical attitude towards all received information that's common to all philosophers, it may be annoying to most people, um, but it's, we unpack things, that, that's, if we have to find one thing, it's one thing we have in common. Uh, we unpack assumptions and claims, presuppositions and claim, we unpack concepts that might not be clear, we identify fallacies, so we break things down, and we break things down um, in order to um, to make things clear. 
-hmm. But I think that just like when uh, uh, about the question of what philosophy is, similarly with the question about whether there's a method in philosophy, I don't think we should be very strict in it. We, we, it's important that it's sort of open-ended because of the nature of philosophy. Philosophy is, has, uh, is very broad. It touches on everything. Um, and I think that's why it can be very democratic. And it's about innovation in thinking and clarity in thinking. And if you police it too much, that can be bad, I think. That can be detrimental to philosophy itself. Mm -hmm. Is philosophy something that can be produced outside of academia or are these questions we've been exploring here, uh, I mean, do they only apply to academic philosophy? Well, it depends, of course, what we mean by philosophy. Of, uh, the characteristic of philosophy is that the questions we ask are questions that people ask all the time. We ask things, philosophical questions, all the time. So if you go to a bar, people are often discussing philosophical questions, right? So um, now, is, can philosophy be done? Do we mean whether we can have original philosophical contributions? That's more tricky because to do that, usually you need to know about the field, you need to be trained because there's a lot of training going in, logical training, analytic training. And I'm always talking about analytic philosophy here. That's, um, I should make that clear. Um, so generally, I think it's difficult to make contribution if you're not a professional philosopher. Nonetheless, I don't think it's the, it, it necessarily has to be done within academia. And here I'm thinking about, uh, I don't know if you, you know Natalie Wynn, who has a YouTube channel called ContraPoints. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. She, of course, she is um, a philosopher by training. I, I, I don't think she ever finished a PhD, but she has, she has been trained in philosophy. I think what she does is philosophy, clearly. Um, Terence Malick, uh, the films of Terence Malick, again, uh, he has, um, he's a Hollywood director, but he was trained in philosophy. So these are examples of people who have been trained in philosophy. But I think it's not in principle impossible that someone can uh, be very good at philosophy and maybe contribute to philosophy with no training. I think it is in principle possible, but generally it's difficult um, nowadays that philosophy is such an academic, this only an academic discipline really. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's interesting that you mentioned people like Terence Malick and ContraPoint. So can, uh, for example, people who make movies, YouTube videos, etc., can we take that as being phil philosophical if they explore philosophical themes? Yeah, I think yes. Uh, it depends, of course. In a, some people will do it more superficially, some people will do it better. Uh, I think we shouldn't exclude it a priori that we can do it, that that, that can be done. I think philosophy should be more open. Um, um, because after all, I mean, I, always, I often think about Natalie, Natalie Wynn's uh, videos because uh, I, think I think they're very good. They're, I think they're, there's good argumentation. There are different levels of uh, understanding the videos that uh, are much more complicated to me than reading a paper, for instance. So I think not accepting that philosophy can be done in different ways is also a form of laziness on our part. Mm -hmm. we, to read papers, we are not trained to break down videos, right? But maybe we should, because maybe philosophy should be more open. Yeah. Uh, would you say that philosophy is a rational enterprise? Um, what do you mean by that exactly? I mean, of course, we it is there's a, in in analytic philosophy there's heavy use of logic. We rely on reasoned argument. I mean, ever since Socrates, at least, um, clear reasoning is uh, very important. But um, in that sense, it's a rational enterprise. Is that what you meant? Uh, yes, more or less. But I I was always thinking perhaps. I mean, there's that sort of uh, idealized version of reason where it, I mean, at least it seems that some philosophers, particularly historical, historical ones, 
thought about reason as being a particular feature of our minds that we should focus on while producing philosophy and perhaps, uh, I mean, ignoring other, I don't know, more, ration, more irrational aspects. So, so, for example, we've been talking here about emotions, personal experience. Uh, I mean, pro probably those are things that uh, we wouldn't immediately put under the rubric of rationality. Ah, okay. In this sense, well, yes, if these are irrational elements, I would include them. Yes, after all, I mean, um, uh, philosophers often create theories, and so there's a creative element in philosophy. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we, we come up with ideas. Um, I don't think that happens clearly on irrational and obvious ways to us. So in that sense, I could say that it's irrational elements. I wouldn't consider emotions irrational, though. I mean, okay. uh, with Freud here, there's a... Um, I would say that there's a cognitive element to emotions. Mm -hmm. I understand. Uh, and how do you look at the relationship between philosophy and other domains of knowledge like science? Um, like science or science in particular? Uh, science in particular. Oh, um, well, I think philosophy lends itself to all other disciplines in general. So um, there's a philosophy of everything, right? There are in every discipline: art, science, um, history. There, there are framework questions. There are questions about methods. So philosophy is there um, to help in 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 those questions, which I think often need to be raised, especially in times of crisis. I think I always say that philosophy is the Jiminy Cricket of of disciplines. Jiminy Cricket was uh, Pinocchio's conscience. Yeah. Um, so we are there to say, okay, is this right? Is this assumption there correct? What do you mean by that? Um, now, when it comes to, I think science generally can work very well without philosophy in general. I mean, after all, we see physicists and cosmologists who are great at what they do. And of, sometimes they are very bad philosophers. They, they do philosophy without realizing it. Um, and they do it badly. Uh, but there are times when I think philosophy could help science, could uh, help with conceptual clarification, definitely. I also think that science, uh, that philosophy must be empirically informed, especially if you do philosophy of science or philosophy of biology or philosophy of mind, you need to know uh, the science behind it. Now not necessarily be a neuroscientist or be a biologist. You might not have that level of knowledge that experts have, but you need to be able to read their work, follow their work, understand their work um, to quite a high level. So I think that um, in, in many aspects of philosophy, science is necessary, and uh, I think philosophy can help science, um, definitely. Mm -hmm. And what about the other way around? Do you think that science can also help philosophy? Yes, absolutely. I mean, when we talk about um, things that pertain, I do philosophy of mind and psychiatry, of course you need to know how, what we know about how the brain works, because uh, maybe we, I, I generally don't think philosophy is just sitting around thinking. Um, you need to, um, um, put your hands in the mud, right? Whatever that is, it might, whatever it is you're doing, you need to go and look at it. So if you're doing science or philosophy, sorry, uh, of mind, you need to know what the sciences of the mind say. That doesn't mean that you take it uncritically, that whatever they say, you accept, um, but you need to know at least their starting points. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, would you say that historically philosophy has been too centered on Western thinkers? It's only been, I mean, analytic philosophy at least, again, but I also think continental philosophy largely, but I, I, I shouldn't be talking about continental philosophy, I don't know enough about it. Um, I think it's absolutely been, it's been for, it's centered on uh, Western white males, yes, absolutely. There's no... Um, African philosophy, no Asian philosophy, 
um, no indigenous Sanskrit anything. Um, I went through my. I, I was thinking the other day that I think I went through my whole undergraduate career, having read nothing other than Western philosophy and almost nothing, if nothing at all, from women. And that's astounding if you think about it. Um, and I think it makes philosophy poorer because. Um, the way we think has to do with our environment. As in, in the West, we have certain very specific ideas. Um, an obvious example is um, the, the very idea that the world can be understood through reason. It's a very Western idea. Yeah. You, and then you read Asian philosophy and you realize that there are people who say that that might be impossible. Um, and I think that would be important because if you think of people, for instance, like Plato, he tried to understand everything um, by the use of reason. Whatever didn't quite fit there, he put aside. So change is not possible. Change is possible. So we're going to remove it from reality. Um, and in the realm of ideas, there is no such thing as change, right? Um, why do that? Maybe if you accept that there are certain things that reason cannot understand, maybe you would go, the history of philosophy would have been completely different. Um, so yes, I think it's absolutely been too centered on Western thinkers. Yeah, I don't know if you know of that podcast done by Peter Adamson, The History of Philosophy Without Any Gaps. That, that is a very interesting one because he basi is basically trying to cover uh, philosophy from all parts of the globe. We already covered African philosophers, Muslim philosophers. I think that also Chinese one. So no, pro probably that's a good approach. I'm going to listen to that. That's yes. I need I need to listen to all that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that's a suggestion. Uh, so, uh, when it comes to the relationship between philosophy and politics, do you think that philosophers should participate in uh, public political discourse and address social issues, social inequalities, for example? Yes, I absolutely think so. Um, I think, um, I think I, this is... Some people won't like this, but I think that philosophy is, in its essence, political. Not in political in, uh, in the sense of political parties, but um, I th this idea comes to me because I really think philosophy is a tool. It's a tool for change. Um, and clarity of thinking is important, but though, uh, of course, it's good in itself, I don't think that that's where it ends. I think philosophy, I always thought of philosophy as very practical. So if we think about things like justice and equality or freedom, we, what's the point of just thinking about them? If there are things that need to change in society, we need to do that. We, we need to be, to be a voice that helps in this. I mean, at the end of the Republic, Socrates comes along and says that philosophy is about how we ought to live. Um, about the good life, about being responsible citizens, um, and of course being responsible, being good parents, being uh, good children to our to our parents. Um, so, if philosophy is about thinking clearly and critically, uh, and the public deliberation is very important when it comes to democracy, I think that. Yes, we should absolutely be participating in political discourse wherever we can, wherever we're given the chance to. Mm -hmm. And what about the other way around? Uh, could politics influence how philosophy is done and would that be a good thing? Uh, when you say politics, you mean... Uh... I mean, I mean, for example, the way someone does philosophy being influenced by his or her particular political ideology, for example. Oh, um, I think that's inevitable. I mean, it, it, politics goes very deep with people, so the, it, it's a whole way of understanding the world. I think it's very difficult to overcome that. On the other hand, being philosophers, you should try your best. Uh, to keep it as objective as possible. I don't mean that objectivity means that you don't have a specific perspective or 
um, you don't have certain views, um, but it shouldn't overtake your cla your your thinking. Mm -hmm. Right, because I mean, I was perhaps thinking here about uh, biases that could arise by people instead of them trying to be, let's say, as impartial as they can, being driven by their political ideology or even any other sort of ideological thinking. Yes, we should always check. We know that everybody has biases, we all do, and we should try and check them. Now, on the other hand, if you really um, um, believe, I, I want to think that as philosophers we've thought about it, so when, so when you decide on a political position that you really think that this is the way things are, um, that will, I think, unavoidably imbued all your thinking. Um, I don't know how you go, you can overcome that, just by always critically checking yourself. Mm -hmm. Does philosophy have a, an important impact on society? Does it influence in any way how the general public thinks about things? Or perhaps does it have any sort of influence on the political realm or other aspects of society? Well, a lot of philosophy that is done today doesn't, of course, because it's highly technical, very specific. Um, but philosophy in general, I mean, most of the things we think about have, have been, have originated in, uh, in philosophy. The idea that um, people have rights, the, the idea that maybe fairness is part of justice, the idea that um, if you make claims, you need to justify them, or that certain kinds of reasoning are wrong. Um, things that we talk about every day are, uh, have originated from philosophers. So, in a sense, of course, philosophy impacts society every day. Now, I, whether it can change, ideas change. So, yes, I think philosophy can have a huge impact. Think about, um, well, some people won't like this, but Marxism or utilitarianism or existentialism and the idea of uh, the authentic life or that existence precedes essence. Maybe people don't realize, don't talk about it in these terms exactly, but these are a part of the way we think about life and um, society. Um, so philosophy does have a way of creeping in even if we don't realize it or people don't realize it. Um, so yes. And of course we are teachers, right? So as teachers, most of us are teachers, so as teachers we try to, to, to teach our students to think critically, uh, not what to think, but to think critically, um, that change has an impact on society in and of itself. These mm -hmm. might go, most of them will not become philosophers, they will become uh, they, artists, uh, go into business. Um, so having someone train you in clear thinking, that has an impact in and of itself. I think you were thinking about more specific things, but I think the impact is there, but it's not clearly seen as a philosophical impact. Mm -hmm. Do you think that it would be important for the general public, I mean, people who are not particularly intellectual or academic, to know what philosophy is about? Personally, I would like people to know what I do so that they don't ask me or tell me, uh, ask me about the meaning of life and things like that. Um, so, um, I, it would be nice for people to know what philosophy is, but I also think it would be good because people have questions. People, uh, even people who are uneducated, raise philosophical questions all the time and it would be good for them to know that there are people who work on these questions and are trained uh, to tackle these questions and can help them with this thinking. Of course, this becomes, it, it's useless if um, most people can't read technical papers. But I think that's why it's important that we try, as philosophers, to produce work that is understandable by the general public. Mm -hmm. I think that philosophy is very practical, can make a difference, but not necessarily in the way that it's been done now, I think it must be broadened. We must be more open. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was just thinking that maybe um, many people think that or look at philosophy as something that is very detached 
from their day-to-day -day experiences, from their practical lives, let's say. I, I mean, I, I would imagine that uh, not, uh, not me myself, because I read philosophy, but most people would look at the sorts of issues explored in philosophy, the sorts of questions asked, as being just part of people who are part of the ivory tower of university or something like that? Yeah, so oh, clearly theoretical questions that are never really answered and, and thus are irrelevant, but I don't think it needs to be that way. Uh, it is that way, I think partially it is that way, because we don't make an effort. Um, and of course, because we're not we're not like science, we don't produce airplanes and toasters and things that people use um, in an obvious way. Again, I think people don't realize how philosophical their thinking is and how we, we, philosophy could actually help. I mean, the most obvious question, um, case, is I think when you become a parent and you have questions about raising your child, what is more philosophical than that? Um, so I, I think, um, again, I think philosophy has a lot to do with practice, uh, but it has to make itself more accessible to people. Of course, people, if I sometimes come across papers that are so technical that I'm, you raise your hands up in the air, or sometimes I feel I go to, um, to talks and, uh, and people start arguing about the minor point losing the big picture and I think it I feel like it's like two siblings this is what it, it often feels like two siblings that are in the 40s that are still arguing about the same thing that they were arguing when they were six years old and you're like enough let's move on um, and I understand that part of um, professional philosophy has to do that we have to go down to the nitty-gritty and do that but of course um, an outsider cannot possibly understand this. And we need to be able to remind ourselves of the big picture so that we can show the relevance of philosophy. And I don't mean this only to, I don't think we should market our discipline. It's not, um, that's not what I mean. But I think philosophy can make uh, a difference. And I think mm -hmm. it will make a difference. Right. Is this book, Philosophy by Women, a feminist book? <laughs> Well, it, yes, in a sense, it is a feminist book in the sense that the, it promotes the visibility of women, uh, that we, we point to injustices. In, in this sense, it's feminist. But it's not a, a feminist philosophy book. Um, I'm not a feminist scholar. Um, I have to say I know very little about feminism. I'm reading about it as, we go, as I go along. Um, so, yes, it's feminist in one sense, but it's not a feminist philosophy book. And another. If you if you're teaching a class on feminist theory, maybe that would not be the book you're going to pick up. You might, but but not necessarily. Mm -hmm. Right. Do you think that women are discriminated against in philosophy in any way? I mean, historically or contemporarily? Well, historically, women have been um, in existence in philosophy mostly. Um, they I. They are discriminated against, um, maybe not, a, not intentionally, but there are way, many ways uh, to discourage women. So I think women have for many years been politely discouraged from doing philosophy, sometimes explicitly discouraged from doing philosophy. Um, but I think genders today, when we know about all these things, we know about implicit bias and sexism, um, I think gender stereotypes have a way of creeping in without us realizing it. And though there are attempts now um, to make women in philosophy visible, um, I think we're not, um, not over, we're not there yet. There's a lot of work to be done yet because there are many ways uh, to keep uh, women out of philosophy or of progressing in philosophy. Um, and, and doing the necessary work so that they can become the best philosophers that they can become. Mm -hmm. Do you think that women have certain traits that if they were to have played the bigger role in the history of philosophy, maybe it would have been done differently? Uh, I don't think that we have... 
there has been an argument made that uh, we think differently or we have different intuitions than men. And, um, and that partially explains why we are so underrepresented in philosophy. Now, I don't think that's the case, uh, but I think that our position in society, yes, does make us have certain traits that um, could make a difference. For instance, um, we are the caretakers in society, stereotypically, right? We take care of the children, we take care of the elderly. Um, in itself, um, that, I think that makes us less vulnerable to the idea of individualism. Um, we know the importance of collaboration. We know, um, uh, oh, I, I don't want to be too general about this. Of course, there are women who don't have kids. Of course, there are women who are different. Oh, and there are men who take care of other people and do it very well. Um, but I, I want, in general, right? So I think there's a sense in which women, firstly, um, um, go against the idea of the philosopher as an isolated, disembodied mind that thinks about things. We are in the world all the time. I, I think about Mary Midgley once, uh, she has a, a paper called Rings and Books, where she describes um, uh, how men used, how priv privileged white men used to write philosophy in the rooms, quiet, right? And then a woman trying to write a book with the kids coming in every five minutes, um, with uh, being pregnant, and I don't know, she, she doesn't say exactly this, I'm elaborating here, um, carrying another being uh, in your body, or maybe having an elderly parent to take care of. Um, just being in this position in society makes it very obvious that uh, collaboration is important. So, and I saw this in the book that I edited. Many women were talking about collaboration and how philosophy is something to do together, and it's best to do it in dialogue. Um, if you think about also the the Oxford Four, um, Midgley, Anscombe, uh, Murdoch, and Philip Foot, they again in ethics they try to bring um, ethics back to real life. Um, so. Again, I think the other thing that women do is that they raise practical problems. They are more practical than men. I don't think that's because, I don't, I'm not, I can't say that this is because of something in the brains that we think differently. I think it's a matter of, uh, up, again, a position in society that makes us have different interests and different priorities. Mm -hmm. So, do you think that it has more to do with the sort of roles that men and women f fulfill in society, the, the gender roles that they are attributed in society that perhaps would influence the way they think and behave and that would probably, uh, I mean, if we had more women in philosophy, particularly historically, then it would have been done a bit different. Yes, I think I think it all stems from the kinds of lives we lead. Mm -hmm. um, that uh, that opens us up to different perspectives and different points of view. So I think yes, I think the questions would be very different. Like again, as I said at the beginning, um, any minority group, the questions would be much more diverse and and different. So mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, uh, so I mean, and, and talking about women in philosophy, is it that uh, historically women have been sort of excluded from doing philosophy or that we had we, women philosophers during our history, but uh, people basically ignore them? I, well, I, I have to admit again that before putting together the book, I didn't know much about women in philosophy. Now, I, the, uh, I really, I, I knew some philosophers because I knew them, because I went to graduate school with them, I heard their talks. But historically, I thought that women really didn't do much philosophy. And then I started reading about things. Um, and apparently, it seems that women have been very active in philosophy, at least since the 16th century. Um, and uh, I recently uh, led the, read a book called um, Women of Ideas by Dale Spender. It's, it's an 800 page book uh, about women thinkers, not only in philosophy, but generally in feminist thinkers. Um, and it's astounding how many of them there are, how much they produced, uh, and how little of that 
made it into the canon or was widely published. Uh, and this is why Eileen O'Neill talks about women writing and disappearing in. Um, women have been um, um, neglected or silenced, but they were there. They were there, apparently. But, but do you think that there would be any particular reasons why um, the, I mean, the most vocal and most known philosophers would ignore these women? Do you think that it was sexism or what? Well, I think philosophy, in, what philosophy in general does is challenge the status quo of the conceptual status quo, um, the status quo ideas. Now, when women did it, and when I, I, I was reading about all these women, uh, they they challenged the status quo of dominant thought, and the dominant thought, of course, was male-centered. So uh, I think that's why that happened, and also because the topic they introduced, the, the, the things that they worried about, were not things that were deemed important in the lives of men. Um, so one one thing is that they challenged ideas that. Uh, and that just goes to show how good philosophers they were. I mean, if you challenge the status quo so much that the status quo has to silence you, that means you're doing something right. Um, so yes, I think they challenged the status quo, they, they challenged patriarchy, uh, but they also introduced topics that seem to be feminine. And of course, mm -hmm. there is a stereotype that, you know, women, come on, we're creatures of emotions, or we are contextualized thinking, we're, we're not capable of... Uh, of doing such work, and that, and it seems that people really, really believe that. Mm -hmm. But do you think that even if uh, the differences we see between men and women are the result of socialization and gender roles that they are attributed in a particular society, do you think that there could also be an element of women in comparison to men not being that interested in philosophy and philosophical questions for for some reason? Um, yes, I think that's possible. I mean, Anita, Anita Allen has made that uh, point about uh, black women in philosophy, that uh, the, it, philosophy has nothing to give them. But I think um, that is partially the case because philosophy will for a very long time, did not accept to raise certain questions, certain questions, for instance, about power, even within the discipline itself. Um, so once that happens, I think women would be more interested. So it's not that they were not interested in the way philosophy is done or philosophy proper. Maybe they were not interested in playing the game uh, in, in terms that did not include what they thought was important. Right. But do you think that nowadays at least philosophy is more inclusive? I mean, may maybe this is a bias of mine, but uh, I know many women philosophers, many female philosophers. So would you think that at least nowadays people are not that uh, negligent of women in philosophy? It's opening up, definitely. It's not like it used to be, absolutely. But of course, we think only about women. Think about how many minorities, um, um, you know, uh, in philosophy, and how many of those people do things that relate to um, things that, I mean, many. there are many women in philosophy. Many women in philosophy do uh, things that men do in philosophy. Uh, but... Um, I don't know, like, it, it's always, they always pick up topics from, first of all, you have to be good at doing the analytic, um, um, the analytic, tackling the analytic questions that uh, are deemed important. You have to do metaphysics, you have to do logic, you do have to do philosophy of science. Then you can tackle questions that are important to women, but secondarily, you can just, go into that. The same goes for people uh, think about Caribbean thought or think about uh, African philosophy. It's very difficult. So philosophy is opening up, yes, but we're not quite there. And, um, and even in terms of numbers, uh, we, we are still underrepresented in philosophy. Mm -hmm. 
uh, as I said, it's opening up, but of course it's not just us, it's not just women, there are other minorities too, so philosophy is trying to open up, but we, this, like society, is trying to um, correct um, injustices, but we, we have a long way to go. Mm -hmm. So, just one last question, do you think that philosophy can empower women? Oh, yes, of course, definitely. Um, um, I think that, um, well, it always returns to clear thinking. I think one, if we break down the, the assumptions and the, the presuppositions that people have about all sorts of things concerning women, um, um, we can correct mistakes in uh, thinking that m make a difference to women's lives, also by creating new concepts. Um, think about the work of um, Miranda Fricker or Kate Mann. Um, they introduced new concepts, they introduced the, the idea of epistemic injustice. Uh, Kate Mann breaks down the idea of misogyny. Uh, once you clarify concepts, then women can make sense of situations, can make sense of experiences, like Miranda Fricker mentions um, sexual harassment. Uh, before that concept was introduced, um, even though sometimes I am willing to grant that it sometimes might go too far, uh, I'm always aware that I'm talking to uh, <laughs> a man. Um, nonetheless, um, having that concept empowers women because it makes them understand um, and make sense of a very uncomfortable situation that they have been going through that other people um, consider to be just flirting, for instance. Um, so I think definitely, yes, it can empower women. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's end on that note. The book is again Philosophy by Women, 22 Philosophers Reflect on Philosophy and Its Value. Just before we go, would you like to mention where people can find you on the internet? Oh, you can find me for brilliant tweets on Twitter. Um, and, um, and I have, of course, my website where you can um, follow my work. It's my name, elivintiadis.com. Um, and of course, you can always drop me a line and we can talk. And um, I'm open to, to discussion with everyone. Okay, great. So, Dr. Vintiadis, it's been a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you for taking the time to come on the show. Thank you, Ricardo. Thank you very much. Have a Hello, everybody. Thank you for watching this interview until the end. So it is thanks to people like you that the show has been running for such a long time, more than three years now. And I would like to ask you to please pay a visit to my Patreon page and to consider making a pledge there. If you prefer PayPal, you can also find links to it in the description box of the interview. Otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, please share the interview, leave a like, hit the subscription button and comment on it. This show is brought to you by Enlights, learning and development done differently. Check their website at enlights.com. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters, Kenny Litzka and Blanchett Perga, Larson, Lau Guerrero, Francis Ford, and Frederick Sunder, Ricardo Vladimir, Craig Healy, Adam Castle, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Wiesel, Jacob Klinkby, Matthew Whitting, Bernardo Wolf, Tim Hollis, Henry Kalenius, John Connors, Paulina Barron, Philip Force Connolly, Jerry Mueller, Herbert Gintis, Rutger Vos, Bo Weingart, Becker Newberger Goldstein, Dan Demetri, Robert Windegger, Rui Inácio, Arthur Coe, Zup, Marco Neves, Colin Holbrook, Susan Pinker, Thomas Trumbull, Bernardo Seixas, Pablo Santurbano, Simon Columbus, George Pinha, Phil Kavanagh, Corey Clark, Mark Blythe, Roberto Inguanzo, Mikkel Stormir, Eric Neumann, Samuel Andreev, Tiago Nunes, Bernard Yugni, Alexander Dunbauer, Omari Hickson, Fergal Cusson, Evan Bodrenko, Alla Herzog, Don Ross, Jonathan Leibrand, Oslan Bullet, Nathan Nguyen, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, J.W., João Eira, Tom Hummel, David Sloan Wilson, Yasila Dez Araújo, Eden Solon, Romain Roach, Dmitry Grigoriev, Diego Londonio Correa, Tom Roth, Yannick Punter, Adana Rusmani, Charlotte Bliss, 
Miran B, Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pavel Ostasevsky, Max Bailby, Nelek Bach, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, Al Ortiz, Guy Madison, Gary G. Alman, my producers, Isar Web, Jim Frank, Lucas Tafiniak, Ian Gilligan, Sergio Codriano, Luis Caetano, Tom Van Egdam, Curtis Dixon, João Linhares, Benedict Mueller, Vega Guidi, Sardus France and Niroban Balachandran, and my executive producers, Michel Rugieski, Rosie, James Pratt and Matthew Lavender. Thank you for all.